Good afternoon. How are you all doing? I think it's time to get up again, isn't it? <laughs> okay, let's get up. You all look very comfortable. Um, okay, so do some stretching. Yes. Ah, feels good. Okay, three jumps because you ate too much. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. All right, you can see that. <laughs> um, so this morning, I talked to you about my life story, but also I talked to you about brain health, memory, and Alzheimer's disease. During the next 20 minutes, I want to provide you with more details and add some meat to the conversation that we had uh, about uh, brain aging, memory loss, and Alzheimer's disease. I must say that my view of what happens to our brain with aging, what is Alzheimer's disease, is not a streamline. What Dr. Jaika talked to you today is the party line, that you get Alzheimer's disease, there's nothing you can do about it, uh, you know, there are some medications that all have failed, it's a hopeless situation, if you have genes, you're doomed. That is the standard narrative that you hear at the Alzheimer's Association. My view is the minority view. I'm not alone. There are about 20% or so researchers in the field that have this alternative view. So if you hear something from me that doesn't quite match with what you heard from Dr. Jaika, it doesn't mean that one is right, one is wrong. It's two views. Um, so with that said, let me start. Now, <clears throat> the part of the brain that's really important for memory is called hippocampus. Hippocampus is also the part of the brain that has the highest degree of malleability. It can shrink and it can grow more so than any other part of your brain. So let me get your hippocampus to work since uh, it's after lunch. I want, you to uh, I want you to memorize the spelling of my last name. It's F-O-T-U-H-I. Can you say it? It's Fatuhi. Okay, so I want you to memorize that. Just do it. F O T U H. Got it? Okay. Whoever can remember the correct spelling of my last name would get a check for ten thousand dollars from Matthew. <laughs> okay. So as some of you are repeating this, you're getting your hippocampus to do push-ups. Now there's also a part of the brain that's important for long-term memory called cortex. Cortex is the outer layer of the brain. This is the part of the brain that's important not only for long-term memory, but also for your executive function, for your ability to make decisions, to navigate, to type, to argue with your spouse. This is the, the cognitive part of your brain. Now, cortex is also a part of the brain that has high degree of malleability. Now, I've written three books about these things. I've done dozens of interviews, and I find it so fascinating every day when a new article comes out that how we can change the size of its areas for better or for worse. So the way it works is this. With aging, there is some degree of decline as you go to your 60s and 70s. For some people, this decline is sharp. The hippocampus shrinks by a lot. For most people, your hippocampus shrinks by about 0.5% per year after age 50. I know it doesn't apply to any of you here, but when you grow older, it will. Now, why is it? Damn it. Like, why? Why on earth the part of the brain that makes us remember things shrink? I mean, this is what I've been studying for the past 20 years or so. And I tell you, my humble opinion is that there are many different factors that shrink your cortex and hippocampus. Alzheimer's disease is the best known, but it's not the only cause. Concussion, insomnia, sleep apnea, obesity, diabetes, stress, depression, all of these can shrink your hippocampus. Now let me show you some evidence. I want you to look at this uh, uh, MRI of the brain. Researchers wanted to know if your brain shrinks with concussions. So they studied college students who played football and compare their brains, and more specifically, the size of their hippocampus, to other college, player, co college students who either didn't play football or played football and had concussions, and they compared. 
Now, I want you to look at these three images. Now, you see the hippocampus? This is your hippocampus. You see it? Yes? OK. So now, this is average size of hippocampus in college students who do not play American football. This is the average size of college students who play football but did not have concussion. And this is average size of hippocampus in college students who did play football and had concussion. Let's call this A, B, and C. Which one is the smallest? C? I mean, it's incredible. This person, this group of people who are in their 20s have a hippocampus that you would see in someone in their 70s. And this is something I see as a neurologist. I do measure the size of the campus. I and mean, once in a while, I see high school students who have a tiny bit of hippocampus. So the size of hippocampus, the shrinking or expanding it, is not a late life issue. It can happen at any time. So what else can shrink it? And what's the evidence? The more depressed you are and the longer period time you're depressed, the more your hippocampus shrinks. So if you worry about getting Alzheimer's, you're actually helping the process, which is not a good thing to do. Um, obesity, there is a linear relationship with bigger belly, a smaller hippocampus. There is a relationship with stress, more cortisol levels, smaller hippocampus, and here's sleep. Now, I want you to look at this here. This is the size of the campus in someone who has had zero years of insomnia, sleeping six hours or less. And that size of the campus is normal. But look, somebody who has slept fewer than six hours for 25 years has a tiny little hippocampus. In fact, interestingly, recent studies show that insomnia can increase the amyloid level, what's called Alzheimer's disease. In other words, what we call Alzheimer's is actually have to do with our lifestyle choices. So what if you have all of them? What if you did have concussions? What if you did have sleep apnea? What if you're overweight? And what if you do have insomnia? Well, the more risk factors you have, the smaller your brain will be. And if you don't have them, your brain will be healthy looking like this. Now, let me tell you this, and don't repeat this elsewhere. Promise? When it comes to hippocampus, Size matters. <laughs> the bigger your hippocampus it is, the less likely you will be to develop Alzheimer's, even if you have Alzheimer's disease in your brain. This is a fact. This is an actual, actual well-established fact that the size of the hippocampus determines whether or not you have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, can you reverse it? Can you do, from, do something to go from here to here? And the answer is yes. Well, the best way to do it is to exercise. Why? Because your brain is made up of a lot of blood vessels. In fact, a third of your brain is made up of blood vessels. So anything that affects blood flow to your brain is going to determine your brain function to a large degree. So I show you this slide in the morning. This is a study in which they looked at the size of the campus after three months of exercise. This is before and this is after. Which of the campus is bigger, before or after? After. Again, this enlargement is not at the microscopic level, it's at a level that you can see with naked eye. A recent study showed that people who walk 45 minutes three times a week have larger hippocampus in one year compared to people who don't walk and experience the usual decline in the size of their hippocampus. Walking one mile a day reduces Alzheimer's disease by 48%. This is not something I found. These are well-established uh, uh, studies uh, in the literature. So why is it that people who exercise have bigger hippocampus? What constitutes that extra volume? Is it all brain cells? Is it blood vessels? What is it? It's both. This is the side view of the blood vessels in the brain. It's someone who doesn't exercise. And this is the side view of the blood vessels in the brain in someone who exercises regularly. These people have 43% increased capillaries and blood vessels, 43%. So if you exercise regularly, you have a lot more blood vessels compared to those who don't. But beyond that, there's also evidence of neurogenesis. There's one point I respectfully disagree with Dr. Jaika this morning. This idea 
that you lose one neuron every three seconds, respectfully, respectfully, is not supported by science that I know of. In fact, what has been shown that your hippocampus generates about 700 new neurons every day. These are premature neurons that are born, and if they're used, they're incorporated into the circuitry of the hippocampus, and if not, they will shade away, fade away. So this is before, this is animals who don't exercise. This is actually reversed. They, they upgraded my slides and they made a mistake. So this is, this is runners, this is controls. And these neurons are actually functioning neurons. They're not glial cells. What else? So the best thing, the one message I have for you is to exercise, get fit. It doesn't mean much to me if you go to a gym for 45 minutes. I want to see fitness because most of the time I'm not sure what people do in the gym. <laughs> it's important for you to do 80, 100 jumping jacks. It's important for you to dance. It's important for you to walk, to hike, to fish, to do things that move you. This is the best vaccine against Alzheimer's disease. Honestly, not only against Alzheimer's disease, against most cardiovascular diseases, and it also helps your gut bacteria. It would also help immune system. So the best thing you could do, and one message you can get from this session, is to get fit. And there's no side effects. No side effects. All right. The other thing that's really good for you is eating a Mediterranean diet, and more specifically, having omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, and EPA. These supplements have been shown to increase memory, increase neogenesis, and reduce the effects of amyloid in the brain. So taking omega-3 fatty acids is a no-brainer. This is the one supplement I take myself, my wife takes it, and my two little girls who are 11 and 13 take it. Now, there are so many supplements. There are probiotics, and there are cannabinoids, and there are a lot of things that you can decide to take. And there, you need to decide for yourself in terms of priorities. But the one thing I can tell you from a brain point of view, omega-3 fatty acids are the building blocks of neurons. The DHA and EPA are the building blocks of neurons, and it's very essential for your brain health and prevention of Alzheimer's disease. I, myself, uh, did a, re a research study, and I reviewed the literature to see the, uh, the relationship between levels of DHA and risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we published this in Nature Reviews Neurology. And we found that people who had high levels of omega-3 fatty acids were less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. The other thing that's important is learning something new. When you memorize a name, by the way, what was the spelling of my last name? Perfect. <laughs> I hope you bring your checkbook. Uh, um, so learning something new is the best way, is one of the ways you can increase the size of your campus. This study looked at medical students before and after three months of intense studying for the national board exam. They did MRIs before, they did MRIs after, and the parts of the brain that increase the size are shown in color. And as you can see, the hippocampus right there is the part of the brain that grew the most when medical students were preparing for the board exam. This part of the brain also grows if you learn a new language or if you learn anything that requires thinking and memorizing written material. Now, some of you are thinking, of, what about golf? Well, it turns out that taking golf lessons can increase the volume of your cortex. Not so much your hippocampus, but your cortex. In this study, researchers did MRIs, a bunch of people, 70 people, who um, started taking lessons for golf, and then after three months of golf lessons, and they compared the MRIs before and after to see if there was a different size, and they learned that, in fact, parts of the brain grew in size. So those of you who play golf now have a perfect excuse to go play golf. <laughs> How about sleeping? If you have insomnia, your um, hippocampus and cortex shrink. And if you have sleep apnea, these parts of the brain shrink. Have you heard of sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a condition in which you snore at night, and during the day you feel tired. And if you are in a seminar in the afternoon, you doze off. So if somebody doses off in front of me, I don't take it personally because I think they probably have sleep apnea. So this is something that's a serious matter because sleep apnea is a major risk factor for stroke, but on the positive side, 
if you treat someone's sleep apnea with a CPAP machine, the brain grows back. This study was done by doing MRIs on a group of people before they started treatment for sleep apnea and after they received sleep apnea treatment, and they compared the MRIs to see if there was a change in volume. And guess which part of the brain changed in volume? Hippocampus. Hippocampus loves oxygen. Oxygen. And so if you're sleeping with the sleep apnea, you're keeping, you keep choking throughout the night. Every time you go like that, you're choking, literally. So treatment of it brings more oxygen, and therefore your hippocampus grows back. Now, another important factor to grow your hippocampus is to meditate. When you meditate, you reduce cortisol levels, and that's good because less stress, better brain, better gut, better stomach, everything is good, right? It turns out that when you meditate, you actually increase blood flow to the brain. Studies that looked at blood flow to the brain in people who meditate versus those who don't have noticed that in addition to reduction in cortisol level, there's also increase in blood flow. And if you do hippocampus measurements before and after, you will see an increase in the volume of hippocampus. Now, many of the studies that I've been telling you have a control arm. In this study, for example, they had groups that meditated and another group that just sat down quietly in a dark room. So it was the active meditation that seemed to be important for the benefits to increase the volume of the hippocampus versus just sitting there. More and more studies are done just like that to increase, to show there's a placebo control benefits in the size of the hippocampus and your brain function. Now, we often talk about front of the brain or back of the brain. But our brain also has a lot of uh, fiber bundles, and there's an electrical activity that goes throughout the brain. And when you meditate, you harmonize the level of activity in the brain, and when you're stressing out, it's zigzag and zigzag of electrical activity. So meditation increases blood flow, harmonizes neuronal activity, and reduces cortisol levels. This is what the brain will look like when you're thinking about things, and something opens a door or closes a door or cell phones, cell phones go off. And then you're thinking, when am I going to be done soon? And then you're thinking, you know, should I take notes or where's my $10,000 check? And, and so your brain has a baseline level of activity. And on top of that, there's bursts of activity when you think, when you move, when you initiate action. And these neural activity are made up of neurons, and neurons need to be healthy. They need blood flow. So it's not just the hippocampus that's important. It's the, blood it's the um, electrical activity of the brain that's equally important. So I'm always fascinated by the things that researchers look at. Why would a group of researchers want to know that dancing would have an impact on the size of the hippocampus? Dancing, by the way, is my favorite recommendation on how you can improve your brain health because it incorporates many things that are good for your brain. There is the um, social interaction, there is learning, there's activity, there's exercise. But researchers did to look uh, to see if dancing can increase the size of the campus. This was done 18 months apart, beginning and 18 months apart. And they noticed that those who danced had an increase in the volume of the campus. So the last one is the one I mentioned this morning. It appears that people who have a purpose-driven life have a healthier brain. I think this is in part because when you do something you love, you're less stressed because every day you're doing something you feel passionate about. You're not stressed. You're happy. Like when I'm giving a lecture to you all, I'm enjoying myself. And this is, I think, why having a purpose in life is good for your brain. Now, I never thought that having a purpose in life would have an impact on whether or not I get Alzheimer's disease. But this is exactly what the researchers looked at in the University of Chicago. They did a questionnaire to a group of people, and they, they asked things like, are there things you feel passionate about? What are the things that drive you? If you just said, well, I, ne I need to make money, so I'm just doing to make a check, is one thing. Is another thing to say, I love animals, and that's why I'm in this field. Those who answered questions like, I do what I do because I love it, had uh, cognitive testing and had MRIs and had measured the levels of plaques and tangles in the brain after they died. And what they found was that people who had a sense of purpose in life had a lot of Alzheimer's pathology in their brain 
and they had no symptoms. And this is what's so exciting. You can have some degree of Alzheimer's in your brain and have no symptoms. What I always say is this. I want to get Alzheimer's after I die. And the reason for that is, if you do all the things you've been hearing about, and you postpone the age at which you become, develop symptoms by 10 or 15 years, so if it's 85, it's 100, then by then you may not be alive. And that's fine. So that's the goal. The goal is to keep your brain healthy, keep the volume of hippocampus large, so that if you do have some degree of Alzheimer's in your brain, you will still function fine. Okay? Now, everything I've been telling you are based on clinical trial and research studies in academic centers. But does it really apply in real life? Does it really apply to us? So to do that, at the time I did all these things and I wrote books, I was assistant professor of neurology. And I decided if I want to do something specific to myself, I'm better off opening my own neurology institute, which I did in 2011. I put together a program called Brain Fitness Program. In this program, when patients come to see me, I make an inventory of all the things that are wrong with them. For example, one person may have obesity, sleep apnea, sedentary lifestyle, and you know, um, vitamin deficiency. And another person may have anxiety, insomnia, and doing things that they hate in their life. And then for each person, I'll make them an inventory that will address. I'll do a brain MRI to see if there's evidence of a small vessel disease. I do blood tests to check your thyroid levels, vitamin levels. And once I knew everything about them, then I would start treating them four hours a week, two two-hour sessions every week. What we do is like physical therapy for your brain. I tell you, no one medicine is going to cure you because Alzheimer's is not one thing. What we call, when we call a 75-year-old who doesn't know what year it is and they forget things and they repeat themselves they're having Alzheimer's disease, they really have five or six things wrong with them. Their brain is a soup of different issues, but we call them, we label them with Alzheimer's disease. This is the same condition that used to be called hardening the arteries. And in 1930s and 40s, in 1960s and 70s, was called senile dementia. And nowadays, we call it Alzheimer's. These are the all same entities that are changing names. In reality, they're all somewhat correct. They are hardening arteries because there is a lot of blood vessel problems. They're all senile dementia, which means there's a lot of different things in old age that contributed to them. And they are somewhat correct to say Alzheimer's because everybody has a little bit of Alzheimer's in their brain anyway. So the terminology 20 years from now may be completely different. In any case, when I see patients, I do not try, I try not to label them as Alzheimer's disease. Because when you tell them you have Alzheimer's disease, they themselves shut down. I only call someone as having Alzheimer's disease if they're perfectly healthy otherwise and they're demented. So if somebody has sleep apnea and their brain has gone down by 18% because of the sleep apnea, I'm not going to call them Alzheimer's just because they're 75. No, they have cognitive decline. I don't call that person as having Alzheimer's. I say, let's go, let's go, let's work. So I do my inventory, and then I put them in this program. I teach them meditation, we give them brain training, make sure they sleep right. A lot of older adults have sleep problems. We give them diet, and most importantly, we get them to walk. Here's the problem. When somebody is 75, 78, they have some knee problem, some hip problem, and they don't move. The fact that they don't move is the biggest obstacle for them to have a better brain function. So I find a way to move them. So I say to come and bike, walk in the pool. I find some way to get them to walk. And by doing that, they start pumping blood to their brain. So I did this for one of our patients. Her name was Carol. She was a 69-year-old woman who was brought to me by her sister. The sister wanted me to confirm that she has Alzheimer's disease because for a year, she was sitting in the house doing nothing. She was, front of, she was sitting in front of a TV, and the sister said, the TV is watching her because she just sits there. She wouldn't do anything. And then she would repeat herself. She was confused. And they wanted to put her in a nursing home. So they wanted me to confirm a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease so she can have power attorney, so she can sell her house and pay for her nursing home for the rest of her life at age 69, which is quite young, by the way. So when I saw that patient, 
who, by the way, came on a wheelchair because she doesn't walk and talk much, I realized that she's only 69. That's young these days. And I'm not going to give her a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease unless I'm sure. So I went through my checklist. She had most of them. She had depression that was not diagnosed. She had sleep apnea that was not being treated. She had a CPAP machine, but she was not using it. She had back pain, and she had done six different medications. She was what you call a total mess. So I started working with her. I tried to taper some of her medications, and I started to walk and give her a little bit of Zoloft to help with mood. And we started this program where she received four hours of training every week. And it was really interesting how this lady developed. Initially, when she came to see me, she was in a wheelchair. Then when she started the program, the first week or two, she came with a cane. And then week three or four, she left the cane at home, and she was walking by herself. By the time her mid-program evaluation came, she was actually coming and talking. This was the first time I had a conversation with her. She was talking. By week seven or eight, she had gone to a gym, and she would come to our brain center with a gym bag on her shoulder, walking like this. By the time week 10 or 11 came, she had multiple hobbies. And by the time she was when she finished the program, she was looking for a job. And this is not the exception. This is not. I mean, it is one of my best cases, but <laughs> it is the best case because it was so hopeless. But we did this for 129 other elderly. And again, 60 is not elderly anymore, but 60 to 85. This was the age group. And we found that of that group, 84% improved. 84% of these patients who were going downhill like this actually went slightly up. And we did the MRIs, and half of them increased the size of their hippocampus by about 3%, which is six years younger. Now, what we do is not amazing. What's amazing is our brain. Our brain has this innate ability to grow, to change. And we just don't use it. It's like a great service that's available to us that we're not using. And I'm not going to blame anyone. It's, I, think, I think the problem is that we do not know it exists. Um, by the way, did you know that in 1930s and 40s, the idea that exercise is good for you was sort of a novel idea? There was an article in the New York Times that there were some doctors who think exercise is good for you. Previous to that, cardiologists thought, well, your heart is going to pump so many times in your life. If you pump it more, then you're going to run out of pumps. <laughs> and it was sort of counterintuitive that exercise would be good for you. And the things I'm telling you today may sound like it's too good to be true. But I promise you that five years from now, this would be a standard practice. But this lady had an MRI before and an MRI after. This is hippocampus before, hippocampus afterwards. How much, which one is bigger, before or after? It's really significant that the growth in the hippocampal volume is so much so that we can see with naked eyes. Now, if somebody told this to me five years ago, I would say, yeah, or 10 years ago, I would say, yeah, there is some increase in volume at a microscopic level. I myself was surprised when I saw that we could see the changes with MRI with naked eye. So this lady, who was very interesting and feisty and full of life, she was a manager before all these things. Came to see me every three months. She actually had another interesting story about her. She used to come with another gentleman who had an oxygen mask. So the both of them were sort of ill looking. And then the husband died, and she looked sad. But three months later, she came. She was unusually happy. I said, Carol, your husband just died. What's going on? He said, well, Dr. Fatui, when I was in high school, there was this guy I had a crush on. And after high school, I ended up marrying my husband. But I really loved the first boy. And since my husband has died, I looked him up, and he's available. So <laughs> And now we're dating. <laughs> it was amazing. This lady was looking for a job, was dating, and, and was a very lively looking lady. So anyway, she said to me, Dr. Fatui, do you think my brain is still that good? You know, I stopped this intensive training. I'm just doing my hobbies, the five different hobbies. And so we got another MRI, and we, t we found out that initially uh, her brain grew by 8.6%. But within the year that she was not a part of our program, her brain grew one more percent. And I think this is what's so interesting. We have the ability within us to grow our brain. And again, this was not the exception. This was the rule. 
when we did this study and we saw the results, we published it in the Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease, and later this was featured in a four-page article in Time Magazine. And again, this is not the exception. This is something I see all the time. So in summary, there are many things that affect our brain. I think we need to change the conversation on whether or not we have Alzheimer's disease to whether or not we have a healthy brain. It's not just Alzheimer's because, frankly, I don't know what Alzheimer's is. If insomnia increases levels of a protein called amyloid, which is the market for Alzheimer's, does a person have Alzheimer's? If concussion increases levels of amyloid and tau, which are the markers for Alzheimer's, and a person is demented, do they have Alzheimer's? And this is what we are now. This is the state of knowledge. What I just shared with you is the state of knowledge. There are more and more studies that show the different things that we do increase the levels of these proteins, which we call Alzheimer's. This is my opinion, and this differs from most things you hear out there. I think that what we call Alzheimer's is a consequence of things gone wrong as, this, as opposed to the source. Now, there's a difference between early onset Alzheimer's and late onset Alzheimer's, and that's the key to understanding the difference. If a 55-year-old or a 65-year-old develops dementia, this is often pure case of Alzheimer's disease. They do have excess levels of these proteins for genetic reasons, and yes, they become demented, and no, there's nothing, can, there's nothing you could do about it. It's like a fire that goes to a forest. And I have a handful of patients like that, people in their 50s and 60s who become demented. Unfortunately, there's not much we could do for that. But, for, and that's a 2% of all Alzheimer's cases, for the 98% other people, it's called late onset Alzheimer's disease. And that's absolutely, positively a preventable disease. It is ludicrous to think that in our 70s and 80s, we all of a sudden have this protein that comes out of nowhere and we get a disease. I humbly and respectfully disagree with that common phenomenon in the field of Alzheimer's disease. Because I see with my own eyes that we help people grow their brain and improve their brain performance every day. These little old ladies or men who come like this, they look like flowers having been watered in a long time. And within 12 weeks, we water them and they blossom. And I love it. I love the fact that these people are alive again. When you tell somebody to have Alzheimer's, you're just telling them, sorry, you're going to have a miserable death. I'm sorry, but you're going to be in a nursing home and that's the end of you. It's worse than death itself. And the, what, the part that's tragedy is that it's wrong. It is absolutely wrong. If there are seven or eight things that are contributing to you become demented, and we pick one and call you as Alzheimer's disease and tell you there's nothing you can do about it, it's unethical. It's wrong. And this is what I'm trying to educate the public and physicians. I give lectures to medical societies as well as lay audiences. But I want you all to know that your brain health is within your arms, within your reach. Whether or not you have a healthy brain is within your reach, especially, especially if you start in midlife. If you have it of uh, sleeping eight hours a night, um, eating a Mediterranean diet, laugh more often, don't take things seriously, don't get angry because your flight is late. If you have that kind of mindset, if you do a little, little bit of meditation, you take a few supplements, you're setting yourself to have a healthy, strong brain just like the way every day you brush your teeth, you floss your teeth, and you have nice, healthy teeth. In old days, everybody used to get dentures. These, people, these days, we don't have as much because people figured out. And what I do and what I recommend is do the same you would do for your teeth. Do it for a brain. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Fatou. We really appreciated that. There's a lot to take from it. We know you're under pressure, so we won't keep you terribly long. Sure. We'll take two questions from the floor if we can. Um, one for me to begin with. Um, stimulants and depressants, caffeine or alcohol, do they have any effect on the diet and lifestyle or the effects you've mentioned? That's a very good question. How about coffee? How about alcohol? So um, I think keep in mind that the most important thing for your brain health is exercise, good sleep, and a good diet. If you've done those things, having a glass of wine is good for you. 
If you have memory problems, do not drink a glass of wine, not even a drop of alcohol, if you have memory problems. And with, uh, with coffee, I think it's good because um, several studies have shown that uh, people who drink coffee are less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Oh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I think that's probably a measure of people who do things. I'm sure Pierce Lyon must have taken a lot of coffee in the mornings, you know? So I think this is not for you to go home, have a lot of coffee to sort of uh, water off Alzheimer's disease. I think it's important for you to do things, to initiate things, and do the things that we know are common sense. These are common sense things. And alcohol is only if everything else is good. Um, second, first question from the floor. Um, you mentioned earlier on and in the talk about omega-3s, and similarly for the selenium yeast, are there particular types you should be taking that are there chosen sources? Uh, I'll take mixed DHA EPA. Um, we have a DHA, yes. Yeah, and okay, algae. so I'll take it is. <laughs> so DHA is DHA, as long as you have it from a respectable source. And I think if you're getting from algae, the algal DHA is the best source because it is from the real source. Fish have DHA because, as uh, Dr. Lyons said, they eat algae, algae. So algal DHA is a pure source and is good. As long as you have a respectable source where you know you can trust the brand, as long as you get about 1,000 milligram of DHA plus EPA, so if 300, 700, or 500, 500, 400, 600, that's what I recommend, and that's what I take myself. And a final question. For somebody who sleeps three hours a night, should they be taking something to help them get more sleep? Yes. Um, so some people say, look, I sleep four hours a night, I have no problems. But during the day, if you ask their wife, they say, oh my God, he's so irritable. <laughs> or, or snaps at every little thing. So they think they're okay, but they're not okay. And if you do have fewer than six hours of sleep, chances are you're not fine. You think you're fine, but you're not fine. Your blood pressure may be high, your cortisol levels may be high, your heart may be going fast. So, but if you don't have any of those, if you're really calm, collected, perfectly, gentleman, everything is good, then that's fine. But if you don't have those things, you have to realize the reason you're not sleeping is because perhaps you have stressful issues that are not resolved. So it's not the sleep that's a problem, it's your life not being optimized that's a problem. And I think this is an important thing to consider, that if there are stress issues in your life, you need to sit down and resolve them one way or the other. You make a list. You know, if you have to divorce something, divorce them and get it over with. If, there is a, if there's something you're afraid of, face it and do it and get it over with. You can't have a situation where for 20 years you've been saying the same old thing, same old thing. So you need to deal with stress head on and resolve the stressful issues that keep you at night. And once those are resolved, and also having a sense of purpose and passion in life, if you love your days, and if you exercise well at night, you will have your eight hours of sleep, six hours at least. If you don't have those things, you can take melatonin. If melatonin is not good enough, sometimes you can take other over-the-counter things. And if you do those things and it still not work, I don't like medications, but this is one situation I would recommend a low dose of something. Some people have general anxiety disorder because it runs in their family. If you look at them, their mom, their father, their uncle, their cousins, they're all stressed and anxious. Well, that's not their choice. They're not stressed by choice. They carry genes that predisposes them, predispose them to have that anxiety. So for them, probiotics, CBD are perfect solutions. And if those things are not enough, you can consider real medications. Doctor. All right. Thank you very, very much.